Mother's Day. I want to encourage mothers, but here's the dilemma. It has nothing to do with mothers in particular. We want to elevate Christ. Not mothers. We want to encourage you. But the reality is that young mothers never pray that God will give them a problem child. Right? I don't, I don't know of one. I've not heard of one. Uh, but the fact is that that little child is born with a sin nature that makes them come out of the womb rebelling. Some of your children rebelled in the womb. That's why you can't sleep at night. But they, they are born sinners shaking their little fist at God and at you. Now, complicate that with single parenting for mothers, mothers married to ungodly men, and, and now all of the dreams, the hopes, the desires seem to end up spiraling into a world of chaos. I want to share with you the story of one mother. Her name is Monica. Monica was married to an ungodly and immoral man. He was an angry man. By the grace of God, he, he never beat her, as happened so often in the culture in which she lived. She made a promise to put a guard over her mouth and never speak in a way that would elicit anger from him because of her sin. Monica had a son who was born into the world shaking his fist at God. As that son grew, he rebelled against mom's godly example and began to live with a woman in immorality. The woman he was living with got pregnant and had a child out of wedlock. Breaking mom's heart. Add to that the fact that now her son gets involved with a cult, a mysticism-based cult, denying the person of Jesus Christ as the only savior of the world, and he becomes a speaker. Her husband dies, but because of her consistent testimony for Christ, he receives Christ just prior to death. But son chooses to move out of the area into another large city as a speaker for the cult, she chooses then to follow him in that city where she can pray. She gets involved in a church, meets with the pastor. The pastor encouraged her by these words. I am confident that God will reward your tears and convert your son. Now his salvation is not anywhere on the, the horizon. But one day he takes his Bible, he goes out and sits under a tree. And he reads out of the book of Romans. And he reads these words, cast off the works of darkness. Those words pop out at him like nothing he's ever seen before, and he realizes he must throw away the cult. He received Jesus Christ as his Savior. He begins to live for Christ. He decides to take his mother and go back home. On the way back home, mom dies. That young man's name was Augustine the greatest thinker in Christian history. Some of you mothers have children in full rebellion against God, and it's easy to give up hope. 
It's easy to despair. It's easy to say, why God? Or you've got a husband who's angry and mean and doesn't love you the way that you think you should be loved. And you say, why God? Why? Do like Monica. Put a guard over your mouth and live in such a humble way that you'll not elicit his anger. And when he is angry, you don't return evil for evil. And when your children rebel, you don't berate them and you don't ridicule them and you don't argue against them. But maybe you go to your pastor and you get counsel. By the way, that pastor's name was Ambrose, Bishop of Rome. You need people to pray with you. You need people to pray for you. Here were Gustin's words about his mother in his book, Confessions. If anyone thinks it wrong that I thus wept for my mother some part of an hour, a mother who for many years had wept for me, that I might live to thee, O Lord, let him not deride me. But if his charity is great, let him weep also for my sins before thee. You don't know what God is going to do in the heart of that child. Don't give up hope. You don't know what God is going to do in the life of your husband. Don't give up hope. You don't know what God is going to do in your own life. Don't give up hope. Many, many mothers, many parents have this ungodly desire. I want to live long enough to see my children. Monica didn't. She didn't live long enough to see the impact that her son would make on Christian history. But God knew. Stand with me. Let me read to you 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 down through verse 7. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, and Paul is writing to Timothy, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, and love, and self-control. You may be seated. Young believers must be encouraged from the heart to continue to grow in their faith. I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that we expect too little from our teenagers. We expect them to rebel. That's what teenagers do. We expect them to be irresponsible. That's what teenagers do. We expect them not to read their Bible. That's what teenagers do. We expect them not to be excited about church. That's what teenagers do. I believe it is that expectation which has a low bar that gives our our teenagers permission to rebel. And I'll be speaking to three groups of people today, all of them represented in in this, this group today. Husbands or men, wives or women, and teenagers. We as believers have to encourage young believers from the heart 
to, to continue to grow in their faith. We, we cannot sit back and just say, ah, oh, but they're teenagers, that's what teenagers do. Let's encourage them to step it up. Let's encourage them to walk with the Lord with all of their heart. Paul fi- fondly remembered Timothy in his prayers night and day with thanksgiving. Some commentators think Timothy at this point in his, his life was somewhere in the age of 18. And he's already a pastor. This pastoral epistle is written to a pastor ordained at the age of somewhere around 18. Most kids today are still trying to figure out life at 18, let alone settle on what God would have for them. I'm convinced, too, that this whole issue of college and education has been, we've missed it. Uh, We ought to encourage our children to understand who they are in the Lord so that they don't waste that sixty to $100,000 that you spent sending them to school or that they're going to have to repay back in loans and not even work in the area of their degree. The vast majority of of graduates get no job in the area of their degree. In fact, many of them find out that they don't even like the area of their degree. Well, that's $100,000 at a minimum today that was just wasted. I I don't know about you, but $100,000 is a fair amount of money. Would you agree with that? That's a fair amount of money. I've I've talked about this before. I'll continue to talk about it because I think it's one area where parents lead children astray when they say something to the effect of, doesn't matter what job you get, just as long as you make a good living. I think that leads so many people astray. It does matter what job you get because it needs to be in the area that God has equipped you to serve him, and I'm not talking just about ministry, I'm talking about in the world. Paul says this of Timothy in in, uh, verse three, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Paul was praying for young Timothy Not because he was a pastor, but because he had an an invested interest in Timothy. He took the time to mentor Timothy. He took the time to nurture Timothy. He took the time to be involved in Timothy's life as a teenager. We need to get involved in teenagers' lives. And I, I don't mean taking them to fun things. Not against fun things. But... When we only do fun things and make fun things the priority for teens, we don't help them mature. The other thing is belittling our children. Paul didn't belittle Timothy. Children are a blessing from God, not in your notes. Children are a blessing from God who entrusts them to parents for a brief time. As a parent, you think, man, these These children are never going to grow up. They drive me crazy. Trust me. We're on generation two now. As grandparents, they grow up so fast. I can't believe my wife is getting that old. (laughs) I am so old. Right? We're aging. We're grandparents now. You grandparents, say that slowly grandparents just sounds old great great grandparents that's beyond doubt old right? but we age it's 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 what happens in life and and you think those children are, that drive you crazy they are never going to mature but they mature so quickly and then they're gone Then you wish for those days back. Children are a blessing from God. We need to begin to to treat them as blessings from God. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit 
of the womb, the womb a reward. Children are a blessing. Let's treat them as blessings, not as nuisances. Children are not status symbols. Children are people, souls. They are our stewardship, and we have a responsibility to see them as the gifts that they are. How would our homes be different if parents viewed their children as gifts from God? How would, home, how would our homes change if children are viewed as gifts from God? Genesis chapter 33, verse 5, you don't have to turn there, um, but it says, when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he, he said, this would be Jacob's children and wives coming after him, he said, who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Graciously given them. God being a God of grace entrusts us with souls. He entrusts us with souls. Not to manipulate not to boss, but to train, to instruct. See, Paul was not Timothy's father. Paul was not Timothy's father, but he took him under his wing and nurtured and cared for him. Paul saw something in Timothy, and he went beside Timothy, and he brought Timothy under his wing, and he began to disciple young Timothy. And we find a very heartwarming statement by Paul of Timothy in verse 4. Paul remembered how Timothy wept when they were separated Verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. And Paul says, look, you're still a teenager, but I derive blessing from you. I derive blessing from you, teenager, because you wept. And probably when Paul was arrested, Timothy wept for him. We, we need to stop secluding teenagers. I think one of, the, one of the problems with the modern church is this division by age. We're no longer teaching young people what it means to see adults in prayer. To hear adults pray. I still think back of, of my conversion as a, as a high schooler and, and going to Wednesday night prayer meeting and, and praying with adults on Wednesday night. I learned how to pray then. It's important that we stop expecting our teens to be childish and that we start expecting them to be mature and to be responsible and to grow and change in Christ if they're Christian. Paul longed to have Timothy minister to him. When was the last time you expected a teenager to minister to you? But that's what our goal ought to be. Our goal as parents and our goal as a church ought to be to help grow and mature our teens so that they can minister to others. Even to others much older than them. Two other times in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul encourages Timothy to minister to him. He says in 2 Timothy 4.9, do your best to come to me soon. Paul was in prison. He, he, this was toward the end of his life when he was about to be beheaded. And the, one of the people that Paul longs to see to, to minister to him was young Timothy, a teenager. Teenager. 
Verse 21 of chapter 4 in 2 Timothy, do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greeting to you. So do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. Not only did Paul derive a blessing from Timothy, but the other brothers that were adults derived a blessing from young Timothy who stepped it up and walked with the Lord and was responsible and a loving young man to these older brothers. Timothy's love for the Lord reminded Paul of the young minister's godly heritage. Timothy had a godly heritage, but it wasn't 100% a godly heritage. Well, fathers, and I, I, I believe this wholeheartedly, while well, fathers should be the godly leaders in the home, the impact of godly mothers must never be underestimated. Fathers are called to lead the homes, but godly mothers have an impact and a relationship with their children that husbands and fathers can't have. There's an intimacy there. And Paul talks about that to Timothy, reminding him of where he came from. Verse 5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. When I look at you, Timothy, your faith reminds me of several generations of godliness. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. There's been this, this heritage of Christianity passed down generationally. Now, you're not saved because your parents were Christian. That's not what Paul is saying. But Paul, what Paul is saying is, look, Christianity can't start out of a vacuum. And, and I mean, without the scriptures, you can't become a Christian. But Christianity is spread because someone gave the scriptures to someone, someone took the time to evangelize, someone took the time to share Christ, and when that person comes to Christ, what we see is a generational um, uh, flow happening. Paul told the Philippian jailer, the Philippian jailer simply asked, what must I do to be saved? And Paul expanded it wonderfully. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your family. He wasn't saying, you believe, your family, they're in because of your faith. No, what happens is God chooses to save generationally and in families. Not everyone in those families becomes a believer, but often what you find is a first-generation Christian comes to faith as the first one in the home and then others begin to come by, by the example of the faith of that first one. That's why it's so important. Uh, parents, never compromise your faith in order to keep in a good relationship with your children. In other words, don't get caught up doing what your children want to do in their sin simply because you don't want to break a relationship with them. You go ahead and let that relationship break. You stay anchored to Christ because when they're set adrift, they want to know mom and dad are still anchored so they can come back to the faith that they once had. But when mom and dad give up the faith in order to keep a relationship with the, with the child, they lose the anchor. And they've got nothing to come back to. Timothy's mother kept anchored to the faith. We don't know how it happened. However it happened that Timothy's Jewish mother married a Greek unbeliever, her positive impact, she positive, her faith positively impacted her son for the Lord. It, the scripture doesn't tell us. We can only guess. It could have been in a time of rebellion. 
It could have been, it could have been in a time of, of uh, depression financially. There are any number of reasons in that day in which a woman, uh, a Jewish woman would have married a Gentile or Greek unbeliever. But whatever the reason, it's very clear, Timothy's father was a, an unbeliever. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 tells us this. Acts 16, 1 and 2. Paul came also to, to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, implied unbeliever. He, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. We don't know how it happened, but she found herself, whether she was converted after she married the man because of her, grand, her, her mother's influence on her, or whether she was a believer who rebelled. We don't know the circumstances, but it's clear in Scripture, Timothy's father was an unbeliever. We also know that while his unbelieving father hindered him from being circumcised, Timothy's heart was devoted to Christ. No good Jewish boy would ever be found uncircumcised. That's a, the, to be uncircumcised is a mark of rebellion. That's why in verse 3 of chapter 16 in Acts, we find Paul wanted Timothy, Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek, parentheses, unbeliever. How do we know that? Because Timothy wasn't circumcised. So two things are obvious about Timothy's father. His antagonism toward the Jewish faith was clear in his keeping Timothy from being circumcised. Remember, mom's a believer, a Jewish believer, faithful to the Lord. She would never allow her son to be left uncircumcised. But an antagonistic, unbelieving father would. Second thing we know about the father is that he never came to faith in Christ since he's not mentioned outside of Acts 16. He died an unbeliever. But we know also two things about Timothy's mother. Somehow, somewhere, she compromised her faith since she was married to a, Jew, a, a Greek unbeliever. Somewhere she compromised. We also know, second, that she was a Christian. Whether she came to faith through her mother or Paul's ministry in Lystra, we don't know. But we know she was a believer, married to an unbeliever. But we know that God worked through that believing mother in Timothy's life. So let me say this to to mothers who happen to be married or have unbelieving fathers in their relationship with their children, don't ever think that the power of the unbeliever is more powerful than the gospel in you. That's one of the things that I see happening in the minds of, of, of women married to unbelieving men or having unbelieving men in their lives who are the, the fathers of their children. It's, it's easy to despair thinking that the influence of the unbeliever is going to be more powerful than the influence of the believer, and that's not the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is more powerful than the power of the unbeliever. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have all the power you need, believing mother, to positively influence your child for Jesus Christ. Don't quit praying.
don't go to sin in, in response to your children. Don't go to sin in response to your unbelieving husband. Stay faithful to the Lord. Do like Augustine's mother and put a guard over your mouth. There's so much you want to say. Don't. You don't have to prove him wrong. It's okay unless it's an issue of, of a rebellion that is going to, to positively or negatively damage your child, meaning he's going to take your kid out for a drink. He's going to teach your child to smoke. He's going to introduce your child to immorality. If those kinds of things, you must stand between your child and the unbeliever. Otherwise, zip it. You don't have to say everything you think. And if your child is in open rebellion against the Lord, zip it. You don't have to tell them everything you think. Learn to be still and know that he is God. Develop within you that quiet attitude of trust that believes that God is greater than anything in the world. A godly heritage, teenagers, should motivate you like Timothy to grow in your faith. Godly heritage should, should motivate young people like Timothy to grow in their faith in God. Don't, don't take for granted the fact that out of every op, uh, possibility of where you could be born, that God chose to put you into a loving Christian home was no accident. That maybe it wasn't a loving Christian home. Maybe it was one parent that loved the Lord. That God would place you in there and give you that influence in your life was no accident. It was the very hand of God from eternity past that placed you in that home. But what we see today is an epidemic of young people leaving the faith that was instilled in them by their parents, despising the gift of God in their godly parents. It's an epidemic today. Now here's what the church wrongly has done about it. Let's, let's give them more games. Let's give them more entertainment because we're losing the young people. No, that's not the answer. How about let's pray more for them? Let's influence them toward godliness. Let's get involved in their lives and disciple them. Let's, as parents, expect more from them, not less. Let's stop using electronics to babysit our children so they'll play nice. And let's let, take them to the Lord. Matthew Henry said this, and here's a couple of quotes from him. I have these on a PowerPoint for you. If we perform our part of the covenant, that's a covenant of grace, God will not fail to perform his. If we improve the grace of God, if we improve the grace God has given us, in other words, if, we're, if it's growing in us, he will confirm us to the end. Let not the children of godly parents expect the entail of the blessing. In other words, don't take it for granted. By doing so, they tread in the steps of those. They tread in the steps of those who walk on them, those that have gone before them to heaven. Keep up the virtue and piety of their ancestors. In other words, if we are going to train our children, we have to keep them from walking over the attitude and the godliness of the parents, and we have to teach them to walk in the steps of the parents. Too many children grow up saying, I don't want to be like my dad. Shame on dad. But shame on the child who claims to be a Christian who thumbs their nose at 
whatever good God has brought into their lives and given them the opportunity to avoid a multitude of sins and go off and do their own thing. Christian children born into, or children born into Christian homes have been giving a, given a blessing. They've been given a blessing. But it's not seen as a blessing in most cases because we're not training our children in the things of the Lord from an early age. Matthew Henry went on to say, those children that would inherit their godly parents' blessing must religiously pursue their pious intentions and not defeat them. If children are going to make a difference, remember, we're not just raising children that are going to treat us better in our old age. We're raising the next generation of godly leaders in the church. And if, if we only expect children to act like children, we're not helping them to see the need of living up to the level of the calling of God in their life to salvation and to sanctification. We're not teaching them that to be justified in Christ is not just that Christ took our sins, it's that his, his righteousness was imputed to us. Justification carries with it the theological truth of double imputation. My sins were imputed to Christ, and his righteousness was imputed to me. Therefore, I have everything I need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ to live up to the level of the calling. And we need to help our young people understand the, the requirement of God to live up to their calling. Teenagers, if God has blessed you with a mother and or a father who loves the Lord, two things must be considered. If God's blessed you with a mother and or a father who loves the Lord, two things must be considered. Number one, to reject your parents' godly example is to voluntarily heap the wrath of God upon yourself. How so? Notice the words of Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Or do you presume on the, right, the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed? Here's what that looks like practically. If God in his grace, teenager, has placed you into a home where mom and or dad love the Lord, he's blessed you with a blessing that he hasn't given to most people around the world. To reject that blessing is, is a greater um, insult to a holy God than for the world, the, the person not raised in a Christian home to reject. Because you've been given the gift and turned your back on it. They were never given the gift. Therefore, the judgment on the one who was given the gift and turns their back is greater than on the one who was never given the gift. It's, it's a big deal. Now, thank God for his forgiveness, right? Right? He doesn't leave us there. What the, the point of Romans chapter 2 is, unless you repent, in eternity, your hell will be worse than the unbeliever who never heard. There are degrees of hell just as there are degrees of heaven. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when all of those gifts for the believer, the wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones pass through the fire, there is this purifying of the gifts that are presented to Christ. And there are different degrees, and Paul's very clear that some will have a lot and some will be saved literally by the skin of their teeth, so as by fire, with nothing to show for it. Yeah, sure, they get to heaven, but that's not the goal. The goal isn't just to get to heaven. The goal is to glorify God on our way to heaven. 
so that in eternity we give the best to the Lord because we've given him the best now. Two, following your godly parents' example is not the end. Just because you have learned what your parents taught you is not enough. You must continue to fan into flame that which has been given to you. Verse 6 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. For this reason, I remind you, this reason, because of your grandmother, because of your mother, because of the faith that you now have, fan it into flame. Don't let it just be smoke. Don't let it just sit there and kind of fizzle. Fan it into flame. Timothy was an ordained minister, meaning he was set apart or appointed. To become an ordained minister for Christ is a wonderful thing. It's a blessing conferred through the laying on the hands of other elders. And, and Paul laid his hands on Timothy and conferred upon him with the approval of the church this wonderful ordination, this wonderful appointment to ministry. And that's why Paul says in, in verse 6, for this reason, because of your heritage, fan, I, rem I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Not only do you have salvation, but you have all of the gifts that God has in store for his, his children. Well, all, all those gifts are mentioned throughout the scriptures, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and other places. Make sure that you fan them into a flame and you're serving the Lord. Paul told Timothy in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So now Paul's, Paul broadened it in 1 Corinthians saying it wasn't just Paul, he was there, he laid his hands. It was the whole council of elders. Now the point is this, all of us have gifts, but ordained ministers have special gifts that equip them for ministry. And the unfortunate thing today is that the ministry has just become a job, just a way to make a living. And that ought not to be because it is a wonderful gift from God. So let me give a few words to Christian parents, men and women, First of all, let me sum up. Moms, don't quit. Don't quit on those kids. Pray for them. Encourage them. When your heart breaks, don't berate them. Don't track them down and become a helicopter parent. Your hovering will simply drive them to more sin. Let them know you pray for them and then leave it there. Your job is not to convert them. That's the Spirit's job. Your job is to live faithful so that they can come back to you when the Spirit's done His work in their heart. Young people, if God has given you parents that love the Lord, don't break their hearts by going off into a life of sin. If you are in that life of sin, repent and give glory to God. Moms and dads, never instill within your child the spirit of fear. Never instill within your child the spirit of fear by manipulating them, by becoming overbearing with them, by becoming an angry person they can't stand to be around, by passing your own fear upon them through panic for no reason. These things are devilish and unloving practices. You say, well, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, it is. Because Paul says, 
in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So if God hasn't given us the spirit of fear and we live in fear, that fear did not come from God. And if that fear did not come from God, it is a devilish fear that will enslave our children and keep them from the freedom that's found in Christ. The word fear according to the Greek-English lexicon, is a state of fear because of a lack of courage or moral strength. Cowardice or timidity. First John chapter 4, verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. How? Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. See, a loving person doesn't use fear to motivate their child. A loving person doesn't manipulate through anger to get the job done. A loving person doesn't instill a, a I can't stand to be around you type of fear. That's the fear of man. And Proverbs says that the fear of man is a snare. But those who trust in the Lord are kept safe. Our responsibility as parents, as parents is not to instill fear in our ch child, but to instill fear of God in our child. Two, and in closing, make it your practice to display the disciplines of power, love, and self-control so that your children become confident in Christ. That's what a parent does. A godly parent doesn't instill human fear or the fear of man or irrational fear into the heart of their child. What they instill is the fear of God. Paul told Timothy in closing, because Timothy apparently was a fearful man. Uh, growing up with an angry man, a controlling father, had somehow instilled fear into Timothy. It didn't come from his mother because Paul affirms the faith of Timothy's mother and the faith of Timothy's grandmother. So apparently, Timothy was adversely affected by his father's rebellion and as a result became a fearful man. He had his own fears too because of his own nature and sin. But Paul told Timothy, God has given us not the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. Some of your translations have a sound mind or self-discipline. So we'll close it this way. It's, it's, it's important that we not berate ourselves. So mom and dad, you may have messed up. Let me say that. Mom and dad, you messed up. Okay? I, I, I've messed up. I think back on my years and I could berate myself for all the things I've done wrong. Why? The thing that you need to do now when you recognize how you sinned against your child is to go to your child, even an adult child, and say, look, God has shown me, through his word, how I messed up as a parent. I sinned this way. I'm sure it affected you. Please forgive me. I love you. I love the Lord. And I want to please him. That's it. What a wonderful way to Restore relationship. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, God doesn't want you to live holding things against yourself. Because if he's forgiven you, you don't need to forgive yourself. If he's forgiven you, you need to rest in his forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
A mother and father who's growing in the disciplines of power, love, and self-control will leave a legacy of grace to their children. That's our goal. You, you may have messed up. You know what? Start now. You don't have to live in the defeat of the past. Maybe, maybe you've been a, a rebellious parent who was much like Augustine's father. Repent. Turn to Jesus Christ and leave your children a godly legacy. Timothy learned godliness from his mother and grandmother. He probably learned fear from an overbearing father. Don't be an overbearing father. Ephesians 6.4 clearly says, fathers... That word father can also mean parents. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition, in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. You can start that today, but you have to start that with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never been born again, if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, that's the place to start. Then the foundation is laid, which no man can lay, which is Jesus Christ. That foundation is laid, and now the Spirit of God can build upon that foundation in you, and you, with the power of the Spirit of God, can build on that foundation as God would strengthen you. Mother's Day is a wonderful day, but Jesus Christ needs to be elevated. No one's perfect. Don't expect perfection from yourself or others, but grow and change through Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? We'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for the examples in Scripture of those practical things where children rebel, parents rebel, Parents teach their children about sin. Children choose to sin. But there's forgiveness in Jesus. There's restoration, reconciliation, repentance in Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your patience with us. Give us courage. Not just a puff-up courage, but a courage that's found in Jesus Christ. May we honor you, Lord, in all that we do and all that we say so that others, not just our children, but others around us could see Christ in us, the hope of glory. We'll praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. Happy Mother's Day. Ladies, there are, what are they called? Scarves. Men, it's oversized handkerchiefs, but they're, they're out there, scarves. And thank you, Becca, for providing those. God bless you.